We've had a fantastic evening here at Porsche Centre East London with Porsche Racing Royalty, Jack EX. Let's hear what the great man had to say in the Q&A. Please raise the roof for Jack EX. Can I, can I just do that again, just to check it's actually you? Wow. Have a seat, you utter legend. Good evening. Good evening, Henry. Thank you very much for coming. This is a bit of a, a, bit of a privilege for all of us. No, I think it's fantastic to be together. And we have only a few opportunities like that. Obviously, you are racing fans of uh, Porsche and maybe other ones, but that's not so important in a way, but... Um... No, no, it is very important. No, I want to say that because um, we are sharing many aspects of motor racing and... Um, and I think to see you tonight, frankly, uh, just to see a, a young Brussels sprout, uh, it's very interesting and um, I thank you. He, I knew he'd be rude about Belgium quite early on. So, he will speak afterwards, anyhow. <laughs> no, I, I just want... Um, you love Porsche and um, there are two ways to call Porsche, probably. What makes it different to any other, any other brand? It's the spirit or the soul or the soul of the spirit, but uh, definitely the Porsche is a very special vehicle because the creators, the family Porsche, the engineers through all these years have made a unique car in a way. But just keep in mind that uh, you are the supporters of Porsche, maybe you, you own a Porsche, maybe you will own a Porsche soon, but um, you are making the soul of um, this brand, this unique car. And if we are here tonight with this incredible expert uh, who says he knows me for uh, 65 years now, um, he will ask all the other question or will oh, that you're curious to know about a large number of cars because the Porsches are always cost 959, 956, uh, 962, 963 and everything. And when you get a little bit older like me, in a way it's difficult to remember numbers. So I need his assistance to uh, drive me to to the different, this different type of uh, cars. Um, one thing you have to know, there will be some more questions afterwards, I'm sure. Um, this is valid for all of us, I think. You are what you are because on your way or on your destiny or the timing, um, you find on your way a large number of incredible people, talented, motivated, passionate by what they do. And in the reality, um, when I say we are what we are, drivers, is because in front of us we had a, a large number of people who, who create a project, who build a car, and often in the case of Porsche, it's a winning car. And the comparison, it's really uh, in life, we have whatever we do, whatever we choose, whatever uh, we are looking for, even if it's unexpected sometimes. Uh, I wanted to be, I never did what I wanted. That's, I want you to know tonight. Uh, I wanted to be a gardener, I never did it. So, so, and it's the truth. I had two options, either gardener, either um, gamekeeper. And it's only now that uh, I reach a certain age that uh, I can do like my mother, have the green hands and starting gardening and, uh, and so on. But what I try to explain is that I show a lot of respect 
to all the people that you never see in life who works in the shade and for most of us make a nice life possible or at least give an inspiration to, to us. And this evening it's basically to tell you, um, beside the fact that I have been a survivor from that era, era Beside the success goes with a number of teammates and co-driver in long distance or curiously also the, self, the selfishness of being a single-seater driver as well and um, in many other categories as well because freedom at, at, the science, at, at the sense in those days, no exclusivity for make of car no exclusivity with a sponsor, there were no existing, but the privilege to, to live next to Jackie Stewart or Graham Mill or Jack Brabham or, or Jimmy or uh, Jochen Rindt. And um, my thoughts tonight is to just to appreciate how lucky sometimes you are because it's not a matter of talent to survive from that era. So I think it's very touchy and very sweet of you to join us uh, tonight in this Porsche dealership surrounded by people we like, friends, and um, so it's a family affair in a way. Henry, now it's your turn. How, how cool is that? How cool, a round of applause. You joined Porsche in 1976. Um, you won the first time out at Mugello in the Group 5 935. You were a, a Grand Prix driver at the same time. Was it a culture shock to be doing both things? Well, as I said, first of all, I think um, you have to know sometimes it's... Um, it's good not to be too good at school. So I'm not going to say that you have to advise your children that I have said uh, it doesn't matter to be at school or whatever. But there's, there's no children listening, they're all in bed. Yes, but maybe there are some children at home. So, um, definitely the fact that I had some parents who was totally desesperated to to see me next to, uh, to the window at school, on the back of the class, near the radiator, looking at the birds and all these actions outside. Uh, they were fairly desperate with the result, but um, although all my teachers were going to say he's bad, he's not good at, at nothing, but he's bad at everything, so it was a total desperation for my family. So they gave me a motorcycle because I was uh, promising every year to work better and I never did. So you can see or you can trust me. Um, they gave me a motorcycle and for the very first time I had the smell of the podium. And um, that took me step by step to the motorcycle, to Sammy Miller. I don't know for those who know Sammy Miller. He's a trial, a very famous trial uh, champion and probably the best of the world. And I've learned to compete in a sport that most of the time you do in the mud, in winter, in ice, or rivers, all kind of things. And I had the smell of the podium and later the victory and... Uh, that has given um, a sense to my life. But I must admit that um, I had no control on that, as I told you about the gardener and the um, gamekeeper. Anyhow, in those days, you could do everything. Uh, Jimmy and all the drivers I've mentioned were doing saloon car racing for Team Lotus. Jack Brabham was doing... Um, uh, the Mustang, um, 
uh, Jack Sears was driving a Galaxy at uh, Brandsatch versus the uh, Cortina Lotus and so on. We were all doing all sorts of uh, things, and I don't think it's every driver can do it. But in that era, it was possible. Today, it's not possible anymore. So, having started with saloon car motorcycle, uh, speed with a motor uh, motorcycle, uh, BMW 700 coupe, uh, Cortina. Uh, Mustangs and others, then I went to um, John Ware with the GT40, uh, the Ford Mirage, and then the Ferraris, the Formula One, the Cooper Maserati, the Brabham, and, and so on and so on. Um, yes, I ended uh, for the last part of my racing career with Porsche in long distance, with talented co-drivers, but more than ever, talented people who unfortunately work in the shade. And I say unfortunately because um, the driver gets the spotlight and only them and I, I think it's rough. So they deserve more than uh, they deserve more than that. Let's get it back to Porsche quickly. Um, we haven't got time to talk about your whole career much as I'd like to. 76? You're, you're driving pretty ropey Grand Prix cars for Williams and Ensign. You get a factory Porsche gig to do Group 5 and Group 6 at the same time. Yeah, just talk us through what that felt like. You have to help me because I don't remember all these, but... Um, they but, know. They uh, know. Yes, I did. They're experts as well. You're right. right. Yes, yeah. I did uh, a lot of Group 6. I did the can -Am at the same time as Formula 1. And also, I think in sport, things are well made. It's uh, hard to climb, it's hard to stay, but it's much easier to start to go down. The downhill is really uh, slippery. Um, and that's why I say most of the time that the sport belongs to the young, uh, the young kids, because now you can call them kids, because at 16, 17, they drive Formula One cars. But um, the opportunity to drive for Porsche was really an outstanding, um, an outstanding offer in a way. And to last as long with the same company was, was 10 years roughly. The scores are incredible. I hate to say that about myself because as I've explained to you, other people deserved uh, that success. But Globally, in long distance racing, I think I've probably, we have won more than um, 46 or 7 world championship long distance race, maybe more than 80 podium, but, uh, and then you mentioned Canam and other things. But um, all that is not really in your hands. Uh, it's in the end of someone, you can call him as you want, but um, timing, destiny, made a hell of a difference. And um, it was a privilege to do these last 10 years because yes, I have been part of um, a number of projects that were very interesting. The 956 was probably the most incredible Group C car and uh, uh, car uh, has ever been built because it lasts roughly also 10 years with very little development. There is the incredible project of um, the Paris-Dakar where I was deeply involved because being curious and uh, wishing being a, a gardener, I thought maybe in the desert I have some chance to, uh, to grow a number of things like 9-11 and 9-5-9, it, it never worked really. But it was fast because the little toy you see there um, was going 230 um, kilometer per hour in the desert. I never did it exactly because I did only 210 because I wasn't brave enough. But my teammate did it. 230, it's fast. But more incredible than that was the fact that a very sophisticated 911 was able to uh, compete with a uh, pure natural four-wheel drive 
vehicles off-road. And uh, we, yes, we did it. I'm sorry, it's always a bit difficult to speak about myself, but um, because um, I just have to be humble about it because I realize that drivers are on the, only the little link to finish a, a project and a job. I think the, the part of the driver in motor racing is maybe 10, 15% because uh, a number of people have done the job before and if they have, if you have the chance that they give you a winning car, and that's a fact for a Porsche, they win most of the time, still today with incredible cars. It's other people who deserve it sometimes more than us. I was just talking to Sean Roberts earlier, who obviously worked for Rothmans for many years, uh, brokering all those deals with Porsche. He said you were the best guy to work with because of your concentration, your dedication, and your, and your team player skills. You were the details guy. Is that a fair assessment? I know when you look at me, I don't look like that for you, but, uh, but um, you I cannot answer to that. Frankly, I cannot answer. I cannot answer to that because um, what to say? I was not too bad. Let's see. But did you make a conscious effort to be involved with the engineering? You, uh, weren't, you weren't just turning up and driving, were you? You were heavily involved. Well, I think we are all are. Uh, in whatever we do in life, we are all, all involved. You have no other option. If you, if you want to progress, we were all concerned. And of course, as you are underneath the spotlights, it's your own interest and you're the interest of your co-drive to do as well as you can because without any doubt, the, um, the satisfaction to come from the taste of uh, winning. Unfortunately, when you're second, it's not quite the same, but winning is very important because um, they have created something, they choose you to do it, you took Derek Bell or Brian Redman or Jochen Maas or Mario Andretti, uh, who is probably the most eclectic driver on this planet. Or Jackie Oliver, I think. Everyone plays a role in your destiny or in your life. But if you don't have... Uh, I have the feeling that if you don't look around and if you don't look about the other people next to you, I think you're missing the point somewhere. I don't know if you agree or not, but um, it's not about me, myself and I. It's about a group of people. It's about life generously. It's, it's about the way we behave with the others. And um, of course, it's easy when you get older to say that because when you're young and especially a race driver, you have qualities or not really good qualities to be used in normal life, but um, uh, yes, I think um, you, have to tr you have to try to be good at two things at the same time. What you do and uh, the people next to you in your job, whatever. And I think all that makes a certain satisfaction about, about the past, maybe, that I don't like to look um, too much backwards because I think it's the future which is important, in my opinion. Um, especially when days become more precious and uh, life goes on. Did you ever have a disagreement with any of your teammates racing for Porsche? I'm sure, uh, I'm sure that I had, so that, that's for sure. Um, it doesn't look that nice in a way, but at least, at least you grow sometimes. But... Um, it's part of life, disagreement, arguments. Uh, yes, disagreement. You have the people you like and those you don't like, you don't know, even know why, but uh, it exists. But it's a common effort, anyhow. If you, if you think about cars, but it's valid for everything, every sport, every activities what I say globally.
when you're doing six hours, six hour races, thousand kilometer races or 24 hour races, you've got to get on with the guy, haven't you? In a way, it shows how amateurs we were in those days. Um, I read someone who is doing Formula One um, this season. Oh, it's a French, uh, uh, a French driver. It's called uh, Ocon. He says in L'Equipe today. He says, "Oh, this year is going to be very, very difficult because um, we have wider tires, uh, we have a bigger wing." Uh, uh, we have more G-force than before, and uh, I prepare myself, uh, myself specially um, for an extra difficult season. I must admit, I had to smile a little bit, and um, all the people around me in Formula One had the same, because when we were driving uh, the Ferrari or the Lotus in 74, and at the end of the 70s, you had... Uh, Huge wings, huge downforce, no uh, no assistance for the steering, no power assistance for the brakes, and uh, to us it it seems to be uh, normal in in a way. But of course, I admit the world is different, and it's a hell of a mistake to go backwards and say on oh, my time, my time, my time. Okay, we live the present. They do it, but. What amazes me, it seems that they've rediscovered, in a way, Formula One today. That's a little bit far away from long distance, isn't it? Let's not talk about modern Formula One, that's rubbish. Okay. Um, but the uh, Porsche had Formula One engine too, huh? Yeah, that was, that was very good. Yeah, the one and a half litre V6 turbo, mm. yeah. Um, when you got into a competition Porsche, did you always believe it was going to be the best it could be? I'm absolutely convinced. That's why I've, I have that, I've made that small list. Yes, you know you have a winning car in your hands. Up to you to stay on the road and to go as fast as possible. Oh, by the way, you know what my mother used to say? Each time when I was going to a race meeting, she was saying, um, be careful and don't drive too fast. <laughs> That's what I did. Did you ever say that to Vanina? No, no, I didn't. Good. Because, you know, your experience is most of the time useless for your children's. She come to you for lots of advice. She must have done. She? About driving. She Did didn't you? on her way. No. She's a biologist, by the way. So when she was 23, she said, ah. That maybe I do racing or something. Okay, go ahead. So, I had a difficult time for 15 years looking for sharing the, res the good results and also sharing the bad results and also uh, fearing um, the possible fatality. So, are part of uh, racing. So, I'm not going to suggest that you have to uh, put your children into motor racing. I think it's better to buy a nice sport car and uh, drive steadily on the road. It's more comfortable. Let's talk about the, the, the specific Porsches that you raced or rallied, because these guys have uh, vivid memories and images, as I do, of that famous black and white Jackie X helmet in a number of different cars. 935. Ah, the 935. Get some thoughts from you on each car. 935. 935. Maybe the most powerful in uh, those days, and um, let's call it, uh, call it a, a monster in a way, where we have almost won every race in the series. And then came the Moby Dick that maybe you saw in Silverstone. I was there in 78. An, an incredible, honestly, an incredible car. I was seven. So you don't remember? I do. I'm, I'm afraid I do. You went with your dad? And yeah. Like you, we you all won. do. We all did that, yeah. huh? All our memories... You and Jochen won ...comes by. from uh, childhood with a father who takes you to Silverstone, to Brand such and then, and then, and then. You won that race by seven laps or something crazy? 
in that car? Well, that means the car was really outstanding. The, Wise, mod huh? the modesty hat is not coming off, is Wise. it? Wise. <laughs> um, that, that was a crazy car. I mean, it just... Yes. It, it's uh, an iconic car, honestly. So, saw which way you went. And I think there is only one existing, in my opinion. Yeah. When you first tested Moby Dick, what did you think? Um, you were a little bit surprised. <laughs> but after 10, 15 laps, you get used to it. Mm. It's very powerful and very fast. Nobody saw a car like that before. Aerodynamically mm. speaking and... Uh, also, the fact that in that era, the turbochargers started in motor racing, uh, it went into another planet as well. You had to get used to, to the speed. But when you're used, you know, at Le Mans, for example, uh, there is what you call the, uh, the king at the end of the Nodier. You go 380 kilometers per hour. At the end, frankly, it's easy. You can smoke a cigarette at the same time. You and then you can watch in your restaurant. You, you didn't were, smoke a cigarette while Someone driving, mentioned the restaurant Les Unodier. In the middle, you could see the people eating in those days at the table in front of the restaurant in, in the 70s. It was not easy to say it if it was salmon or, or... But you could see more or less, really. And the dessert you could see too, with the different colors of the ice creams. True. You're having them on, True. aren't you? True. But at Mulsanne, it's, it's a chance to rest. The straight you had yeah. the chance to rest. You say, how do you manage to say uh, six or at the wheel, or four or three or whatever? Um, it's very resting, the Le Mans straight. It's a place where you can. Uh, I don't say sleep because it's not true, but um, almost. Um, 936. In, in your first season with Porsche, you were driving 935 and 936. There was one weekend at Dijon. You won on the, on the Saturday in the 935 and on the Sunday in the 936. I'm really getting old. You did. There were two really? different. Yeah. There were two different championships. But I was not alone. You won both. You and Jochen won both races at the weekend in different cars. But if you can't remember, then there's no point talking about so it. No. Obvious, obviously, we were the best that weekend. You were, yeah. How did, the, how did it compare jumping out? You of know who was in the car in those days, uh, in the opposition, the BMW with Sir Ronnie Peterson, who was doing very well. We were Mark. very concerned uh, because he was really somebody very special. Mm. Mm. I didn't want to talk about BMW tonight. Yes, but you have to agree that in life you yeah. have to be to tolerant on many aspects. Huh? Yes. We are yeah. not alone, huh? uh, we, yeah. because otherwise there would be only we, uh, two ports at the start on the front line and then that's it. Do you, do you think we'll get away with it if we talk about CSLs? Yeah. Mm. How did, uh, tell me about jumping from a Group 5 car to a Group 6 car. One's a production car, one is a prototype. They're, they're very different. Did you have a preference? No. <laughs> I've got to interview him tomorrow at the show, and again tomorrow evening. Wow. No, really... Um, you love them both, as, yeah? No, as I told you, as I told you, and uh, you know it because you, um, you have lived it at the same, for some of you, the same period of time, we were able to drive everything and we were happy with everything. Um, the final, there were no financial aspect on it. And I would like to say that in a way, we were real amateurs. Professional, maybe, because we were driving every weekend of the year, but real amateurs. And that's probably why the era was so nice with people like uh, Ken Tyrrell or John Wire. And yes, the idea was, of course, winning to be the best, but 
the ambience, the feeling, the atmosphere was quite different than what we used to live today. And um, I don't know what you like, uh, what type of racing you like, but have you been to Goodwood? I'm sure you have all been to Goodwood. And um, I always wonder to know by curiosity why uh, we have all these fans, drivers or make of car, we have all these fans and all these people who desire to, to follow racing and uh, they are looking for emotions and so on. But uh, I always go back to Goodwood, and I must admit, because... Modern, modern racing, it's maybe too clinic in a way. I don't know. Can I say that? So, too clean, too, too perfect, too... I like Goodwood because I am allowed to promote Lord March. Yes, yeah. Good. I work for them as well, that's fine. Thank, thank um, you. Yeah, but you're um, from a generation of drivers who did drive everything and there were no commercial pressures. Um, it's sad in a way, isn't it, that, that no, great, great all-rounders can't show that. I was mentioning uh, he doesn't want me to finish with Lord March, but um, what I like about uh, Goodwood, it's very professional. But every amateur of motorsports is treated like a guest. And that's the reason of the success of the festival and, and the revival. And I would love to see that in uh, motorsport because it's proof you can do it. Uh, why is the, um, the um, classic motor show and uh, vintage car and classic cars are so, uh, so well known today? Why, why there are so many people around? Because... In my opinion, you can share your passion with other people that, that you never met before. You can talk with them, you can exchange. Uh, if you go to United States, for example, uh, all the drivers are dedicated to the fans, the public. They do a lot of things. Actually, I would love to say uh, modern racing is fantastic because it's my life. But I would love to see it a little bit more human, in a way. I don't know if you agree on that, but... Uh, and it's not spitting in the soup, huh? It's just because I feel a little bit sorry, because I would love to see you tonight and say, wow, wow, racing today, it's incredible. Luckily, we have racing like uh, Endurance Racing today, who has produced good racing. But um, not everyone likes uh, endurance racing. But I would put a little bit more humanity as an ingredient in these meetings, and uh, I'm sure it could be very, very successful. Let's go back to a time when we did have that, fortunately. You see, he always bring me back to... Um, we want to talk about, we, Yeah, we need to talk more about Porsche. Tell me about Group C. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, I was there as well, aged 11, at the six hours. I wore, I wore a Chopin watch, can I say that? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, I appreciate the fact that you are Porsche fans. And I, because that's one of the reasons you came, for sure. And I appreciate... Um, the fact that some desire to, to own a Porsche because it's represented motorsport. Porsche represent like Ferrari, really represent a big name into it. And it's a family uh, business in those days. Father, son, they were educated in it. And, um, but you are the mirrors of these people that you never saw, you never met people who want to create their own car because they didn't find it on the market because that's the reality with Porsche. It came from a very little, little shop into uh, an industry where um, you sell, I don't know, 200,000 cars, maybe more um, a year. 
it's an iconic car and racing play definitely a, a very big role in a very big role into it yes and other people we do it uh, like the championship this time you have a, a lot of young drivers uh, bamber uh, um, um, hartley uh, Tandy, uh, Tandy, yeah. uh, Andre Lotterer will represent uh, us, and uh, I, th I consider, frankly, it's a privilege to be uh, an ambassador of of Porsche or or, or Chopa or few other people, because um, behind the curtain there are a lot of talented, very talented uh, people. Your connections with, with Porsche and Chopin, of course, they sponsor the, the World Endurance Championship 919 Hybrid. Have you had a go in that yet? I think... Um, I'd like to see that. If they look for a third age, a fourth age driver, maybe I have a chance. But I have strong doubts, knowing uh, the Germans... Um, <laughs> I'm not, I don't think they will uh, give me a car, even for a few laps. They don't trust me anymore. I don't believe you. But you have to accept that. Huh? That's life. I reckon you'd still be quite quick. But maybe for, not for driving. <laughs> Who knows? That's for another time. Yeah. Anyway, back to I know, the... I the wrong moment, okay. Back to the 956. Um, when you first drove it, what did you think? I would say like the rebel, I was thinking that I was going to the moon. Fast. Yeah. Fast. Fast. But you know you have uh, the right car and the right people around you. Did you first drive a prototype at, say, Weissach? Yeah, we, all, we were all driving. Um, I think, I don't know if you know Weissach, but Weissach is the... Um, uh, the, the engineering center of um, Porsche. And also, I'm sure you are aware that um, um, they do a lot of studies for other brands uh, in the world, even air, airplanes. Um, I think the group of engineers today is maybe three or 4,000 people. And you never know what they do. It's very secret. They kept it uh, secret. But in those days, Weissach was the very first development center, and we were testing all our cars um, up there. In the middle of the building, the office building, there is a small race course, but oh, there is an airplane coming. So, um, mm. don't look. Um, yes, it was very special really very special and the development was made there and then starting the season you knew you knew you had the best possible toy how soon before that that first race in 82 did you try the car were you testing it before it was made public we always did it, a lot of testing before we went to Paul Rica for Rehearsal the 24s and um, it's part it's part of modern racing, but I must add we had no simulator in those days. Uh, testing was fairly empiric, um, few computers, and um, it was an addition of comments how to set to develop or try out the springs or the bars different stowing, different camber, different uh, torsion bar, different settings for the engine. It was all handmade. It was not by uh, computers. That's why I think it was fairly, still fairly amateur in a way, with incredible uh, result. And um, the conclusion of that is to say that uh, I think uh, we had um, 17 wins. 18. I'll come back to you. And that, um, yeah. Porsche is the largest, uh, the largest number of wins at Le Mans. When? 
Do you have any questions? Because he has no hang, questions. Anymore. Hang on. I, I've got lots of questions. Good. Got, but yeah, we, we will get some questions actually uh, in a moment or two. Um, the 962, how did that compare to the original 956? You never the, give up, huh? No. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm determined to get this information out of you. That's going to be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Strange interview, isn't it? Mm. Very odd, but, but, but brilliant as well. That yeah. I don't know, but... Which one uh, was the 62? The, the development of the 956 with the, the, feet in, the feet behind the axle. Same procedure for everyone, for every car, every year. Three months of testing, internal, maybe one month external in different places and then uh, go and winning until the retirement of Porsche in, uh, in 60, 70, 95, that was the end. But I wasn't there anymore. I, I knew what you meant, yeah. Um, you won your first sports car race in a Porsche in 76? And you won your last race in a Porsche. In no, I won my first uh, uh, my first race in 1967. Yeah, sorry. You won your first Porsche and race. And the last one in yeah. 85. Yeah. Your first race in a Porsche, you won at Mugello in 76. And you, won your, and you took your last Porsche win in, um, in Malaysia in 85. There is always an end for everything, isn't it? Yes. I think this is a test. I think this is a test. I'm not sure I'm going to pass. You see, um, it's, a tra it's not a strange interview, but I think it's difficult to speak about a group effort uh, because you're not the only one in it. We worked on something. We were not alone. We had the satisfaction to, to do well. Um, it's true that I have the privilege to, to have done a large number of things well protected by my guardian angel. But um, I must admit I'm not very good by saying all my secrets about how to uh, set and prepare a car. Because who knows, maybe I go in Formula One uh, in a few days. So... I'll be the oldest one at the start. At least I can beat the record. Have you got a favorite Porsche race? I think I know what you're going to say. Le what Mans, it is? Le Mans 77? No, it's, it's no. Because I won with every car possible you at Porsche. You told me earlier it was Le Mans 77. <laughs> it's on video over there. You were 14. I know what you want to say. Sometimes... Enfin, you always try your best, definitely. Whatever you do, whatever in your world, you always try your best. But sometimes, sometimes it's different. It's even better than all the other days, and you don't know why. And um, he's referring to, to a race that we shouldn't win, frankly. We had two cars, I was in one car, we had an engine failure, it's happened sometimes. Uh, I was res drive, reserve driver on the other one, so I went as a reserve driver. We were 41st and 12 laps behind the Renault at the time. And we were convinced that the race was over. And honestly, you don't bet a single uh, dime on uh, winning a race like that. But when you see the result after or every or after every or and you win three places, four places, and then rather than being 41st, suddenly you realize you are tense, you start to believe, to believe it's possible. And then it gives you some wings sometimes. And that's what did happen to all of us. The drivers, the engineers, the mechanics, they did an unbelievable job. And 
at the end we won. The conclusion of that is never give up. Until the flag, you haven't passed the flag, still your chance remain open. And this year, there was a reproduction of that in a way. For those who have followed Le Mans these years, like me, I was convinced a lap before the end that the Toyota has won the race. Convinced. Everybody was convinced. The Porsche team and also Toyota was convinced to have won. They didn't. It was very unfortunate, frankly, because they deserved, they really deserved what they did uh, until there. So you see, when I say never give up, it's really the traduction of even if the mountain looks high, very high sometimes, too high, you still have to believe that it's possible. And I think that's the conclusion on every situation, every problems you can have in, on this world or, or in all life. Yes, trust is possible. I've spoken to Jürgen Bart and Hurley Hayward about that, and they were both wide-eyed and could not believe the, the speed, how much faster you were than everyone else. So you say it's a team effort and it's all about the people, but they were that fast. day, it was they about were, you. They were fast. They were, we were all fast, uh, frankly. But the charm uh, of Le Mans this time was that... Uh, we didn't have to get to take care of the gearbox or the brakes or the engine. We could go flat out and it never happens. And it's nice to go flat out with a, a race car. Also, I forgot to mention that we have no ref counter on uh, the car. So uh, it was a nice opportunity to over-ref the engine without being uh, seen, you see? So... Um, which is why it fell onto five cylinders at the end. And that's yeah. the reason at the end, uh, of course, I didn't want to drive at the end, just not to show it was me or have damaged the pistons. Huh? Call, so, you, call yourself a team player. That <laughs> you have to be now. clever. You have to be clever sometimes. Huh? Yeah. So you share. But it was a very exciting and um, an incredible race, frankly. Okay, um, time is flying by, which is what happens when you're having fun. Um, questions for this amazing that man? That must be uh, Brian, Renman, uh, Brian Renman's uh, type of interview, isn't it? Yes, yeah. I'm sure Brian, Brian yeah. and uh, Derek are very good. Yeah, I interviewed Brian about his book at the RAC Club and I didn't speak for 20 minutes. Ed, lovely, uh, Ed, really fantastic. lovely co-driver. And uh, I saw them recent a year or two, and they say, well, thank you very much to have shared with me all these moments, because without you, it wouldn't have been the same. And it's true. It wouldn't have not been the same. Has anyone got a question for Jackie? Jackie, good evening. My name is Graham. Um, this is probably a strange question, but uh, I'm thinking less about the race cars, more about period road cars. I've got three Porsche 928s. And I guess as a, uh, as a factory driver, you'd have had the chance to drive everything and everything, and I'm sure you got the cars back in period. I was kind of curious as to get a view, and I did ask John Fitzpatrick the same question. What did you think of the 928 when it first came out? This is the 40th anniversary. I'm curious as to your recollections of, of the car in period. It's very, it's very embarrassing sometimes. I have to be careful about what I say. You with friends, go ahead. But, but, it's a unique car. And it's probably the fast rose car ever produced with the most incredible handling. I, re I remember very well having done a number of times Milano to the French Riviera via Genoa. You know all these tunnels uh, around? 200 kilometer per hour, non-stop. And there are some corners there, huh? Really, maybe you feel a bit, but it was incredible. Really, a unique car. Good, good job. After, three. Thank you. After the design, it's a matter of taste, huh? of course. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Hi, my name's Jamie, and um, I'm interested to know of the competition cars which you've driven, the Porsche competition cars, which is your favorite and why? 
and um, accepting the uh, comments about nine to eight um, of the Porsche road cars which you've driven, um, uh, accepting nine to eight, let's say, which is the other one that you would choose to drive? It's a very embarrassing question. I because asked you, usually you didn't answer me. Because usually the drivers only remember the bad cars they have driven. They never heard any of us saying that a uh, winning car is a, a nightmare. So it's embarrassing because when you had the chance to drive 10 years in a row in different type of categories, open car, closed cars, uh, Paris-Dakar, oh, the Porsche was not supposed to do uh, to do that. Uh, the baby, I don't know if you remember what the so-called baby that we enter in the uh, German Championship for one race. Um, they were all winning cars, not always the same winners as drivers, but the car was always a Porsche, and um, they had really a total domination on uh, their subject, and. It's easy to, well, sometimes it's annoying when people do things too, too well or too nice because you can predict who is going to be the winner. But how can you say to someone who does his job well that um, he does his job? That's what Porsche uh, did. And that's why today you are, you are here, uh, you are in this dealership because you are raising followers, you have uh, your tenderness for certain drivers, or your tenderness for certain cars. Um, and it's all about life and a nice way of living. Also, you come back home, you have some conflict maybe with your wife or prefer a Ferrari than a Porsche, and uh, it's part of the job. And uh, the disagreement you mentioned Yes. It's part of all these contradictions. But um, yes, a Porsche is a great car, definitely. And um, it will remain like that for quite a while. Although that whole world is changing a lot uh, today. Maybe in 10 years' time, there'll be only uh, electric uh, racing cars in the future. And, and frankly, I hope not. <laughs> Hello again, Jackie. Uh, we talked about Spa earlier on, about racing at Spa. What's your favourite Porsche model around Spa? Mm. You drive fast car, I think, by memory, yeah? Uh, yeah. I, drove, uh, I drove a year or two a GT, GT3. It's fast at Spa. I find it looks fast to me. The radio and all these things, it's... Uh, there are two iconic uh, race courses, in my, in my opinion. The Nordschleife, the Nürburgring, um, that they only use, in my opinion, for the 24 saloon car race. And, um, and uh, Spa, it's not the old Spa, but it's still fast, it's still, the surrounding is incredible, fast corners and... Um, uh, a 911, it's a nice tool to enjoy yourself. Because in reality, you can enjoy yourself with your car any other place than a, on a race course or an Eden Road uh, somewhere in Switzerland or in Austria or in the middle of nowhere in Africa. Otherwise, there is always a radar somewhere to, uh, waiting for you. Huh? So, um, yes. If you have a sport car, we're not using it time to time, carefully, intelligently, at Paul Ricard or Le Castellet or, or Franck Orchon. But um, to enjoy what you have in your hands, it's a good place, definitely. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more. Jackie. Um, you've raced in period against some of the, raced with and against some of the great drivers. Was there anyone who stood out when you were on the grid with them, when you thought to yourself, the best I'm going to do today is come second? 
Uh, but the inspiration comes from those you want to beat. Huh? Definitely, it's clear. Uh, who gives you the inspiration? In 65, it was Jimmy, uh, without any doubt. Uh, later on, it was uh, Jackie. It has been Jochen Rint. There were a few people able to win, but when you make your classes, uh, you have to be humble. You have to be uh, totally dedicated to beat those who are your teachers, uh, in a way. Never forget that uh, in a team you was, I don't say, I shouldn't say enemy, but the man you have to beat is your uh, co-driver, in a way. Number one or number two, or whatever. You have to, to beat him, but... Although I don't want to, um, I don't like to look backwards too much, I must admit that um, the end of the six, the end of the 60s with John Surtees and uh, Graham and Jack and, uh, and uh, Dennis Hulme, Chris Amon, I was in New Zealand uh, two weeks ago for a commemoration for Chris Amon where I was sharing the, the wheel of uh, Formula One Ferrari in 68. The atmosphere, the atmosphere was splendid. Although the danger was more than present, uh, you can realize that that's why. I think I've said at the start of this family uh, meeting where we have said a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, the privilege, and it's not a matter of talent, it's clear to survive that you just need to be lucky. Eh? That's all. You have some more lucky, some less lucky, but... Uh, lucky. That means racing was nice in those days, in those days for sure, but um, there are plenty of sad moments uh, as well who help you to who help you to grow. I think we're done. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Jackie, thank you. That's been um, fascinating. I think you have and been very patient too. Huh? Very, very thought-provoking. Well, I'm really, um, I really enjoyed having your interview, even, and to see you. Normally, I never do that. Honestly, it was just uh, um, there have been a number of opportunities, and uh, I have no regret because um, it's amazing to see so much interest into a sport and so much passion from all of you and. Um, I think in this complicated world, sometimes you have few joys in a way. When you look Monday's newspaper and you see the result of motor racing or motorcycle racing or athletism, we have all different feelings for different uh, sport. But the sport takes a very important place today and uh, it's clear that you see, if you see Usain Bolt doing well at the Olympics, Inspiration, I love that word, inspiration. It gives to the young people the desire to, to do something and we are there to, do, to give them an end to climb. It's now time for you to sign lots of autographs. Ah, no, 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 you say it's finished then. <laughs> no, no. no there'll be, I promise you there'll be a riot if you don't. No. I know you love doing that. Thank um, you, Ennio, thank you very much. Jackie Thank X, you. ladies and gentlemen.